Philip. There are two Philips in the New Testament. Someone raise their hand and tell me what are the two. Brother? The disciple and the deacon. Okay, and who was the deacon? <laughs> That's good. Does anybody know? All right, here we go. Who's, who's Philip in, in Acts? This is why we're having Bible study type lessons. Stella, are you afraid I'd ask you? You have no idea. Brenda? I don't believe in this. <laughs> Nelly? I don't know. Sister was asking me about that. Okay, Philip was a deacon in the book of Acts. He is the one that had all the daughters. Yeah. He was a missionary. He was like a missionary also. Yeah. He um he was a he was a good evangelizer. He's is the that one that Philip was? Yeah, he's the one that evangelized to the eunuch. To eunuch. Yeah. He went to the he appeared to the eunuch mm -hmm. on the way to Ethiopia after he had left the and he was reading in the scripture. That's the Philip that is there. Okay, but the Philip we're going to talk about this morning is Philip the disciple. Um, let us to, uh, turn to the book of John, chapter forty, uh, chapter one, verse thirty-four and forty-five. Okay, Sister Marisa, with your one eye, would you read it? <laughs> Brother Hugo. And Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Okay, come and see. Huh? Yeah, that's something that Nathaniel would say, our Nathaniel would say. Okay, we have talked about Peter, James, John. Is that all we've talked about? And who? Andrew. <laughs> Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Now we have Philip. Philip is not mentioned in any of the Gospels except John. Uh, John had a tendency to write more about those around him and what was going on right, right around him, whereas Matthew and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Luke was a second hand. So Matthew, Mark are more um, in a historical type of writing. But John, because of his personality, he wrote a lot about what was going on around him. So he's actually the only one that mentions in his um, writing Philip. Now, how many of you actually, I'm not even going to say still, how many of you read your Sunday school lesson? Okay. Uh, the word or the name Philip is from what culture? Greek. Why, Sister Noreen? Yeah. Okay, what happened was at the time of Christ and his birth, Alexander the Great, this is history which helps you to understand the Bible. Many times we go into the scripture in our class that has to do with the spiritual, we have to do the practical, and we're going to the history because this is what helps you to be able to understand a lot of why things are written like they're written. Okay, at the time of Christ, the Romans had dominion over Israel. Uh, before that, Alexander the Great had invaded all these areas in here. And the Greek customs, uh, language, began to be absorbed by the different nationalities or the different cultures. And in this case, um, they were called by the Jews Hellenist. H-E-L-L-A-N-I-S-T, Hellenist, that absorbed the culture and absorbed the language. Uh, and in Philip's case, he 
had must have come from a Hellenist Jewish family because he knew the language of Greek, number one. Number two, he was called by a Greek name, Philip. He had to have had a Jewish name because he was a Jew and he had to have a Jewish name. But he preferred to be called by that name, Philip. Because as you go through down through all the disciples, you're going to see that all of them do have Jewish names, except Philip. And uh, we have even uh, Philip the Great, uh, different people later on in history that are called Philip or even before. And it did not come from the Jewish culture. So first of all, we want to establish that there was a difference in his upbringing to the other disciples. And you say, well, Sister Carol, why is that so important? Once again, hello, Sister Rakalita, Mr. Winston. Uh, after we have studied already these other four disciples, we have seen that each one had uh, qualities and had characteristics that many of us can relate to. And then he brings in, now we come up to Philip, a person that has had a different background than all the others. What does that make you think, Sister Floyd? He had a different background? Yeah. What does it make you think about the choosing of the disciples in this, this thinking of Jesus when he went out and he chose his, his disciples? That he was not a respecter person. That he was, that he was um, that everyone has something to offer, no matter what your background is. Right. Okay. The fact that he was Jew is important because the the new covenant and the new uh, pact had not come into being yet until his death and resurrection when when he arose. And then there's a, a whole new dispensation, and we have with. Peter, where he receives the vision to go to the Gentiles. Basically, G Greeks were Gentiles. Okay? Just like the Samaritans were a mixture, too. But we don't have a Samaritan disciple. But now here we have one that is, and I'm not going to say that he was part Greek, but I am going to say he was influenced by the Greek culture, which would have been Gentile. So, to me, when I'm reading all this, and I'm studying all this, and looking at this, and meditating on it, I think about a Christ that foresaw down through the, anal, uh, the, 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 um, the halls of time, and he saw how many cultures, how many countries, how many nationalities were going to be born into the family of God. He gave us an example. Once again, he prepared the way. And he did not have any preference with Philip. He didn't cast him aside. He accepted Philip for who he was. We're going to see as we study Philip that what he had as a Greek background became beneficial to the work of Christ. Those of you that studied your lesson, you'll see it. Anybody see the lesson where you can run off the bat see it? Brenda? Okay. Sister Valerie also. When I studied it, I saw that he saw something more. Like he was seeking like an evangelist or something. Like when he knew about the, the, the Messiah, he went to go find Nathaniel. He was always seeking, always moving. Like an administrator. Like okay, but that, that's that's another uh, characteristic of him. But I'm talking about the Greek part of him right now because that's where we're establishing the fact. Okay, as Sister Brenda said, it's his background helped to reach. Remember, we're talking about an age or an era of time in which the Jews were scattered all over the place. Remember on the day of Pentecost how many nationalities and nations were represented there? Okay, Jews were everywhere. So many of them, it's just like uh, some of you in here. You were born here, yet your roots are what? Maybe Ecuadorian, maybe you're... Mexican, you're Nicaraguan, maybe you're uh, maybe have to be one of them Cuban things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but where your roots are that, but yet when you're born here, what do you absorb? And your your English? Your Spanglish? Your Spanglish? Because they uh, my girls speak 
very good, impeccable, both of them, English. But when they leave out of the state of Florida, everybody wants to know what their accent is. And I just say it's Miami because there's no other one. We all have an accent. There is an, and they, they declare up and down they don't have an accent. But you got an accent. Florida. Florida always has an accent. No, it's not Florida. Uh -uh. The Tapanians speak different. And the Jacksonvilleans speak different. You just called Tampa a different name. I know. <laughs> Tapanians and the Jacksonvilleans. They country, that's why. <laughs> okay. But the point is, is here that Philip, having this background, reached out to another culture. They were Jews, but they spoke Greek. That's what I'm trying to say. That's why on the day of Pentecost, connect the dots, uh, class. On the day of Pentecost, many of the disciples and, and Peter, when he stood up to preach, what language did Peter speak? Uh, well, his own, his own language. Right? His own language. It was, it was either Yiddish or it was Greek yeah. at that time. But what did the Bi what does the Bible say? in chapter 1, that everybody heard in their own language. Their own language. Because it had to go out. The gospel had to go out. Gr uh, Greek, okay, it is one thing where that is your culture, and another thing when it is a learned language. Believe you me, I don't speak Spanish like any of you do. It's a learned language. But when it's my language, even the idioms and the words many times that I use, people are like, where did that come from? Uh, if you were born here or you were born in certain regions, you would understand. Because it goes over your head, right, Carla? That's why Carla's going to raise her hand. I don't get it. <laughs> okay, the same thing happens with Philip. And what I see in this, the bottom line in all this, and all that go around stuff, was to show you that Jesus foresaw that we needed an example, that we are not exclusive. He already, and you can, to a certain degree, uh, this is a very technical point, is he was already reaching the Gentiles. Christ was. We had that in the situation of the Samaritan woman, and we had this now with Philip. Not because he wasn't Jew, but because of his culture. He was reaching already. Because many times we say that it was with Peter. Peter uh, got the greater vision. We understand that. And he was told to go out to do something that had never been done by a Jew. But Christ already, in a subtle way, was reaching out. Now this is Philip. He was called the Greek. What does the word Philip mean? Horses. Love of horses. Love of horses. Love of horses. Okay. Um, and then another attribute that we're the attribute that we're going to talk about in a little while is one that Sister Valerie mentioned. He had an attitude of what? What did you say, Sister Valerie? Seeking. Seeking. He had a seeking heart. Now, to lay the foundation about Philip. Philip also was one of the disciples that was John the Baptist's disciple. And yet, when Christ called him, now there's something else for you to put in your little notes so you'll know about him, was that Philip was the first one who received a direct command from Christ to follow me. He was the first one. <laughs> and he had a seeking heart because he was seeking after the Messiah. When he, he saw that, then where did he go? We read it. Where did he go, Hugo? He went to Nathaniel. I'm glad you heard me. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I would be a very bad fourth teacher. <laughs> yeah, okay. He went immediately to speak to Nathaniel to uh, uh, introduce him to Christ. Mm -hmm. And then we have Nathaniel, which will be coming up later on. Okay, John 12, 20 through 22. Let's turn the scripture there. Okay, someone read it. 12, 20 through 22. And there were certain Greeks among them who came up to worship the 
same came there for the Philip, was a vet say that the Galilee desired him saying to her, he would see Jesus. <coughs> Philip cometh and selleth and he would get in the Okay, so we find here that Philip, first of all, that's the first thing we establish, is that Philip introduced the Greeks to Jesus. Okay, and then he was from the same city as Andrew and Peter, which establishes the fact he's in the second group of what we will call the disciples, where we have already talked about the divided four, then four, and four, and the first one mentioned is Philip. Uh, John 1 and 44, someone read that. <coughs> Now Philip was from Bethsaida in the city of Andrew and Peter. Okay, so he was from the same region. He was a fisherman also. And he, yeah, that once again shows us that he was a Jew, that he came from that same area. So we're just verifying these points. Now Philip is always mentioned in the, the group, the second group is uh, Philip, Bathar, uh, Bartholomew, Thomas, and then Matthew. Okay? Uh, then we also establish, these are four points that you need to know always, is that he's not mentioned in all the, any of the Gospels except the Gospel of John. All right. Now, when he goes to Nathaniel in John uh, 21, who, had, who was reading there? John 21. Yeah, John 21. Because it's there in chapter 1. Okay, go in, in chapter 1. Philip, find it, Nathaniel? No, no, no. Oh, no, I thought that was chapter 1. John 21. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm John. sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, John 12. Now, that's that's where they wanted to see Philip. I've got the wrong scripture, and I'll find it in the same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. No, two. Two and one. Read it, Sister Mara. Oh, John two and one. Mara says, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Go, go ahead. And Keep the reading. mother of Jesus was there, both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus says unto him, They have no wine. That's that, not the one. That's not the one. Yeah. But you were you were referencing uh, Philip going to Nathaniel. Okay, okay, keep going. Okay, so Philip and now Philip was a bit silent in the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathaniel and says unto him, We have found him of Moses in the law of the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Okay. What, says unto him, come and see. Okay, what he says there is, we have found him. Uh -huh. Why does he say we? Okay, Nathaniel and Philip had been studying and searching the scriptures. They were followers of John. And when Jesus comes and approaches him and says, follow me, then right away he runs to the one that he had been studying with. That we have searched the scriptures. We have been looking for him. I have found him. We have found him. In other words, together we've been working on this thing. Now finally we are finding him. And that's why he brings Nathaniel into the picture. Because he and Nathaniel had been studying dil diligently the scripture to, for the coming of the Messiah. And it's very important to me that a person with all these butts behind him, that Jesus had called him to follow him and he immediately did it because his heart was right. And this is what is so important for us, even to be a witness for, for Christ. Our hearts must be right to be able to share what we have. And our lives must be right or people are not going to listen to us or people are not going to watch us or people are not going to pay attention to what we have to say. Our hearts must be right. Our lives must be right. And it's, it's not necessarily what they see. We have to realize that people are very perceptive. There's 
like I said a while ago, we got a couple two smart girls that are real smart. Not all of you are smart, but I know that they have excelled in school. But people want to know answers, and people are perceptive when you begin to speak, whether you are quoting or whether you're feeling. Does that tell you something? Because if you can quote scripture like a parrot, it's not going to make an impact. But if you're feeling it, we have found him, Nathaniel, finally the answer to what we've been seeking, what we wanted, we have. Right away, Nathaniel was convinced. Well, you know, Nathaniel, the scripture we've been studying, I think we have found him of who it is. He came with the right attitude, and we can learn with this and from this that our lives, we must know him personally to be able to reach out. And people at your job, they know you better than you think. Yes, they do. Because there are a lot of perceptive people in the world in a sense, not because of the knowledge they have here, but because it's just like they can sense. And it's, it's just something in some people that they sense the spirit, they discern it, they know it. And they may not be a Christian, but they can discern. There's just, I've seen a few things and I've heard a few things on that person that what they're saying doesn't click with. It. And this is a warning to us as those that are seeking Him, having Him, and sharing Him. That people out in the world, if we're going to reach them, we must be up to par. And, uh, Nathaniel respected Paul, uh, Philip, or he would not have gone with him. He, has, he respected his opinion. He, expect, he respected his knowledge. Uh, he understood that he had a seeking heart, and that if he had found him, then that was good enough for him, and he went. Now, do we make that kind of impact on people? No matter where we come from, what language we speak, or how we look, or what culture we are, we're still making an impact of some sort. And as I read these disciples, and I see them, I try to put myself in every one of them. Some of them fit me, some of them don't. But the fact that some of them have things, little things, that can teach us all. Somebody raise their hand. Yeah. I'm my aunt sisters are uh, one lady, and I would never say this because we have people that profess to be Christians, whatever. Well, she'll come into my ear and say, My spirit doesn't take to her. I don't know what type of Christianity she's professing. And she wonder, Why would she say that to me? And I ask her, Why would you say that? And she says, Well, because I know I see you. I see you. There's something about you that makes you different. But when she would hear someone else, because some uh, lady made a statement that God talks to her all the time, every day, and she says, Oh, something's wrong with that. State. I didn't say it. I didn't get the opportunity because a lady there said something's wrong with that because I don't think God just talks to you and only you're right. So people at the office watch it, even when you don't say anything, they even watch your actions and what you do. And and I also think about this. Um, Philip knew Nathaniel. So they had a personal thing going here. But at the same time, when you bring it into strangers, uh, we know that Jesus is the Son of God and that he sees the heart. But then when Andrew and Philip become part of the group of disciples, that means to tell me that Peter, uh, Andrew, James, and John all respected Philip already. Otherwise, there would have been a certain withdrawal or rejection there. But they didn't. They didn't reject him. They knew his testimony. They knew he had a seeking heart. They knew who he was. And this, the, uh, there's not that much written about him in the scripture, but it, there's some deep truths here to realize that we are building a testimony. Over years, over months, over weeks, and over days. And whatever we say and do, and, and our testimony ne necessarily is not built among the saints. It's built out there. Because that's where you are. 
See, you're in here, what, two and a half hours on Sunday morning? Maybe five hours on Sunday? And another, maybe seven eight hours to eight hours in a church building at the most. But all the others, and I don't know how many more hours in a week there are. But just take those seven off. you got all those other hours out there with people that I have no clue who they are. In here, we don't know who they are. I don't know their names. I don't know what they look like. I don't know where they come from. I don't know what they eat or what they drink, what they do, how they talk. I don't know nothing about them, but you do. And you have a relationship to them, and you are building a testimony. And with one wrong thing, you can pull it down. With one wrong expression, expression, you can pull it down. Because after a while, when people see your testimony, they don't expect those things. Right. So when they come out, you're like, what is this? They're not used to it. So that brings you down. Now, the Bible teaches us that our job as Christians is not to come to church and listen to the message. This is a blessing that we have. To, to gather together and to sing praises and worship God. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said what, Sister Grant? We are the light, so we should shine out there, not just under here. Right. We, it says, and his last words to the church was what? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. It's not to be, and don't take your light and hide it under a bushel. There's so many things that he said. He didn't want us to be isolated. He, he wanted us to shine out. And Philip already had a testimony. And he had built it. And that is our job as Christians. And the day that we do something wrong, believe you me, they will notice it. That is why you say, uh, you always, um, you're always doing the same thing, you're always going to the same places, you're always doing the same thing, because the day that you go to, let's say, let's say you eat hamburgers every day that has nothing to do with sin, but every day you're eating hamburgers, and one day you decide you're going to go and eat healthy, you're going to go have a salad. Everybody around you is going to be talking about, what's got in them that they want a salad? They're hamburger people. They're meat people. So anything we do, it comes to light. And we want to build a testimony. Why do we want to build a testimony? <laughs> We want to glorify God with our lives. And uh, people, you know, people see God in us. And maybe they can uh, turn to God. Okay. We are showing the world. We are the book. Now, the Bible calls them epistles. We're walking letters is what we are. Walking books. And we are the one, the only thing, or the only book, or the only letter that the world is going to read. And when they see us, they are judging all Christians by what we say we are. That's why today there's such a bitter taste about Christians in their mouth. Yes. Is because I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And then yet they're not presenting Christ in the right way. So here we come along and we're making a difference. So our testimony, we, we were talking about it in another area completely. But we must be responsible consistent, these were the words we were using in the conversation the other day, my husband and I, responsibility, consistency, um, uh, knowledgeable, all these things we must c continuously use in our life if we're going to affect somebody else. The first people we're affecting is our household. What do our children think of us when we become and I will use the word anger because there is different kinds of anger. Okay. What do our children really think of us when they see us angry? And I'm not talking about little kids. I'm talking about those that are already reasoning about being Christian. And what do they think about us? Oh, I'm not asking you to tell me. I want you to tell me. I don't want to know. But just think about it. When they see you upset over something and your reaction and what you say, what are their thoughts? If they were the neighbor child, would you act like that in front of them? And the reason why I put it so hard like that is because we were pastors for so many years, and so many years saints would be praying for their family, and always we would come back to this one point. 
how do you live in front of them? That's the first question you have to ask yourself. How are you really living in front of them that challenges them to want to be a child of God? Philip had a testimony. So we must build our testimony in the first place at home. The second thing, is, and once again, I don't know where, where I got off on this one. I have been so, so thinking in the last, uh, it's a lot of things times when I read articles and things. But I was thinking this past week about the, the thought that for years I had used in different ways. Is that God placed souls in our hands. How many of you had children? Okay, all of you in here, with the exception of, but now you're a mom now. You, you, except you, I have okay. a golden retriever. <laughs> huh? I have Go, a golden retriever. <laughs> all of us have had children. When they were born, they were innocent in God's sight. And they were souls that were placed into your hands. We're going to put your hands in. These are always spur, spur of the moment things. This one's icy cold, and this one's... This is Ashley, and this is... Al no, this one's Alexis, and this one's Ashley. Okay. God put these two souls in her hands. One's cold, one is lukewarm. One after a while is going to be bothering her. But there's still what God put in her hands. Because this one's cold, the reason why I'm saying it's going to bother her is after a while that coldness is going to make the pain in the hand. Well, the same way it is with children. When God gives us children, He puts those children in our hand, and I don't care what their sicknesses are, what their personalities are, or, or what they grow up to be. We're, we're responsible for it, and especially when they're in our hands and they haven't made their own decision. So the way that you're living at home, what you're saying, even your form of correcting, you can be 100% right, but if your delivery. yeah, your delivery is maybe a few uh, we call them colored words, uh, shady words, and you are talking to them like that. That child is judging everybody here in their mind of being a Christian like their daddy. And I'm not talking about just the congregation, but the whole. Whole, whole world as Christians, they're judging, they grow up with that. Then when they begin to understand, it gets worse. In the sense that your children then begin to realize you're not what, what, what the Word of God, you're not what the Word of God is writing out and saying. Because they know. And it's amazing how young they are when they begin to know. Right? They begin to realize certain things, begin to see certain things, and begin to say, but, but the preacher read this, or my Sunday school teacher, the teacher said this, and I don't see that in mommy and I don't see that in dad. So I go back to what I originally was talking about, was the fact that many times we can't win our family because of our testimony. Because when we go to work, we have a different mask on. That's the bottom line. And the way we live, the way we talk, the way we are. Philip was consistent. He grew up with Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and Nathaniel. They all grew up together. So they knew each other. And when Philip went to Nathaniel, whom he had influence over, he said, We have found him. Nathaniel believed him. And that's why we, as, as children of God, those that profess to be God's people, that our testimony is so important to us that we can't influence someone. That when you can say, I am saved. And if it, it, it always happens. I don't know if it happens to everybody, but a lot of people I have talked to, especially uh, my girls when I talk to them, is that when you live that Christian life and you're on your job, you, become, you soon become the um, therapist of the office because if they have a problem they know you're going to pray and that you have a certain amount of wisdom and you're going to help them and that's where our opportunities come to lead souls to Christ and I'll tell you like I told a sister this past week when some, something uh, and I 
said it years ago too to, to other people. But uh, when things happen and we have sown the scene, I had an older sister come to me not long ago, and, and they were kind of weepy about it. And they says, "Sister, the Bible says that you sow, you plant, and God will reward you accordingly. But you've done your job. You've done the thing. You can't make. I can't make. I can't make Hugo be saved." And Hugo can't make Stella do certain things because she has a right to make her own decisions. But once you have done what you're supposed to do, God will reward you and you just keep doing it. You can't expect everybody to get saved that you witness to. Because they have their own decisions. They like the world they're living in. They want to stay there. But it doesn't take away the, from the fact that we have to live in such a way that we are affecting other people. And it starts within our four walls. Okay, Philip, once again, back to Philip. Now, Philip had other qualities in him. And it was not just the Greeks, but he also had the qualities of the fact that Philip, um, he was in the account where we have John 6. <coughs> okay, read, Sister Jane. Six, five, through seven. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. John six. Uh, John six, five through seven. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread that this, these may eat? Okay, why did he ask Philip? Huh? You think he was testing him? Um, he knew him. Okay, what does it say, brother? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Yeah. Okay, but yet, why did he test Philip? All right, Sister Marisa, tell us. Marisa likes him. <laughs> you like Peter? But you're not loud now. <laughs> um, he was a numbers guy. He was a numbers guy. Administrator. He was an administrator, but he was a numbers guy because as soon as Jesus got that out of his mouth, what did he say? Verse 7. Oh. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a bread. How come he knew already? He had already done the math. He had already done the math. He had already figured it out. He had already looked at it. And as soon as his brain was working right away. He had already had percent. Yeah, and without a doubt, he was probably realizing there was a restlessness going on around here in the crowd. And it's after 2 o'clock and everybody wants a piece of bread. And... We can't feed them in his mind because they got, and then I see this also, <laughs> you don't think I'm weird. But this is another one of the qualities that Jesus wanted in his disciples, in, in, in his group. It takes all kinds in the church to be able for the church to function. Okay, is it wrong for him to come back with an answer like that, brother? No. Why? Yeah, what, was it wrong for him to answer Jesus like that? Well, he was thinking in human terms. There you go. Why? Because that was what was in him. That's who he was. He was counting the cost of what it would be. So we are prone to believe that he was probably the one that was in charge of making sure that the disciples ate and that they had lodging. Uh, we know that who was in charge of the money bag? Judah. Judas. So we know one was in charge of the money, and, and, and Christ had seen the quality in him that he was a good numbers guy. And he figured it out for the disciples. Many times, probably, where they were going to eat or uh, where they were going to sleep that night or if they had enough money in the purse to be able to do certain things. That's why right away he says, 200, maybe that's what was in the bag at that time. And that's what they had, and he knew that. And he's thinking, we don't have enough to feed them, in other words. Was this a lack of faith, Sister T? Mm -hmm. 
So in him, at that moment, it wasn't like a faith. Because Christ was in his ministry, and there were certain things that they had not seen out of Christ yet. And I think that one of the most astounding things that, that Philip saw was the fact that he could take the bread and multiply it and give so, to, to over 5,000, where John stipulates over 5,000 men. There were much more people than that. I would say there would be anywhere from 10 to 11, just giving each man a wife, not counting children, or, or maybe they were children and their wives, whatever they might be there. But you've got to go from anywhere from 10,000 to 12,000 people there. And here, he's thinking, we can't feed out of our purse these people. But yet, at the same time, he knew he, Jesus could do the miracle, but yet, it, it, in his mind, human mind, he couldn't calculate it as being a miracle that could be done out of a circumstance like that. They just he, he sent him to heal the sick and cast out demons, but giving food, that was really a new one. Think about it. It was something new. He only did it twice. So really, that was a, something unusual. Brother? Are you oh, there? Oh, you. Sorry. Yeah, it's true. You're saying because as humans, unless we're very visual people, and because maybe he hadn't seen it before, done yet, then it was not a lack of faith. But the second time, or like if he uh, had already seen it, and then he was doubting, then it would have been considered a lack of faith. But because we're humans, we tend to, like, in our experience, we tend to say, oh, you know, God helped me in the past in this situation. He's going to help me again in this other situation that's similar to that situation. But it's something that we've never faced before. It's like kind of scary. It's, it's scary. It's uh, not that we doubt that he can't do it, but we've never seen him do it. And we have no knowledge of it. And, and sometimes we, this is one of the battles that uh, this will help us, that even Philip had to get over at this time. He had to get over the human part of it. And, and then by faith, because we, we many times have certain, okay, this is my dog. Right, she's more of a black and white person. She's like her mother. I mean, and, and a numbers person, and this away. We, we, you know, if it's there and accomplished it, we're black and white. And what's written down, that's what we believe in. What we, and, and many times, and I know she for sure she had to do that, many times we have to remove the black and white and step out by faith because we don't see it. We don't understand it that way because that's not the way that it's written down or the logical way of doing it. So by faith we have to. This helps me as I study Philip, me. Because he was a numbers man. He was he was sort of kind of pessimistic in his attitude. He was uh, he had all these different things against him, just like Peter. Peter had many things that were against him too. When Peter uh, uh, wanted to do certain things or he would speak out loudly, but uh, he he didn't allow all these things to hinder him in his service to God. And then we find out here in the end as. Even though he was limited, even though he was inadequate, in other words, he didn't have faith to say, oh, okay, we don't have the money, but you can go ahead, you, you do miracles, you can give them bread, you got to take care of that, Lord. And I kind of asked myself the question, do you think any of the disciples would have said that, Lord, I know you're going to take care of feeding them? What did they all say? Let's send them away. Yes, so really, poor Philip wasn't the only one. He he just knew that it couldn't be done with what they had. But I imagine they say only in you know multitude it must have been. That's overwhelming. When I look at uh, I've had over I've had over fifty or sixty people eat in my house at one time, and I, I look at them and I look at my pots and I have to pray. I had to pray. But in one of them they counted the men and there were five thousand. That didn't include the women. Women or children. So imagine. You know, of course, the human is going to kick in and say, we have 200. <laughs> but, but despite all that, yeah. Jesus accepted them. And then he did the miracle to encourage their faith. What bothers me is, why did the second time? I would have said, all right, God, do what you got to do. <laughs> you know, why did you say, okay, so how Because the group was bigger. Huh? The group was bigger. Okay, but still. <laughs> God is bigger. I mean, you know, he, he lived, you know. We know that now because we read it. Yeah. But they were. But imagine accepted. they saw it. <laughs> but they, they saw the first time. him as the Messiah. Oh, and yes. when, when God, let's say God healed you of cancer. Mm -hmm. But if you get cancer over here, do you have the faith for that? You got to start. Yeah, I know he did it here. But is he going to do it here? Yes. You humanly doubt and you humanly. Yeah. Humanly. Yeah. 
Your human kicks in. This is where all the disciples were human. And their human kicked in. So if you want to know how Philip died, read your lesson.